I come to the Soviet Union and its history principally as an economic historian, so um, in introducing the topic and giving you some background to the Soviet Union under Stalin, I hope you'll forgive me if I take this particular perspective. Um, if you take the Soviet Union in the 1920s, uh, first thing you need to bear in mind is that uh, Joseph Stalin, Stalin being a pseudonym, um, meaning man of steel, uh, we will drop in my attempt to pronounce his proper name at another time, but um, it, it will come out as gobbledygook if I do it now. Now, um, more practically, um, we have a number of lieutenants at um, Lenin's side coming out of the Bolshevik Revolution from 1917 through to 1924 and, if you like, the succession following uh, Lenin's death, it wasn't obvious that Stalin would be the successor. And to a certain degree, Stalin took the period from 1924 through to about 1928 to consolidate his position. Now, in political terms, we are looking at uh, minimising criticism, um, putting to the margins those people who are most likely to challenge Stalin and his particular perspective. By 1928, uh, Stalin's position of power had been largely consolidated, and I tend to take that in the way that he moved from the new economic policy, the compromise that Lenin had uh, accepted in 1921 to allow a degree of capitalism uh, to operate under the uh, control or the direction of state ownership. Now, by 1928, we effectively have God's plan, the planning unit um, of the Soviet Union, uh, a unit which operates all the way through to the collapse of the USSR in 1991. Stalin was um, confident that um, in the context of moving the Soviet Union towards a fuller definition of socialism and greater state control, uh, without wishing to be hackneyed about this, um, you know, following Marxist lines of owning or controlling the means of production, that um, the Soviet Union could A, move away from the new economic policy and the state could take much greater control of what was happening within the production envelope, so to speak, of industry and agriculture as a whole. But also, they could start applying techniques um, to forcibly industrialize the Soviet Union. Uh, the USSR, the Russian, before, the Russian Empire before 1917, wasn't, quotes, backwards, unquote, but it was known as the grain basket of Europe. And therefore, um, relatively speaking, it had not industrialized to the same degree as Germany or Britain or even France and Italy. Now, in the threat of p potential Western conflict and an attempt to restore the Tsar, there was a concern in the Soviet Union that they weren't uh, as well equipped or as prepared militarily to repel another, um, uh, another front, so to speak, another war. In truth, in the 1920s, very few of the Western powers had any stomach for a further war. Um, there was some adventurism by Winston Churchill um, trying to promote uh, support for anti-Leninist, uh, anti-Stalinist forces, but that really came to naught. More practically, um, the legacy of the First World War had put uh, everyone uh, in a position of reflecting on the nature of war and the destruction that followed, because the First World War was mechanical destruction on a scale not seen before. So to a certain degree, the Soviet Union had some breathing space. Now, Stalin from 1928 onwards decided that that breathing space was going to be used up unless they acted fairly, fairly swiftly and in a concerted way. That involved the first of the notorious five-year plans. The idea that the Soviet Union would lurch somewhere into the 20th century with its in, in industrialization. Um, following um, plans of production and uh, the generation of an industrial infrastructure 
which was largely lacking at the time of the revolution itself. So as we consider this, and now as we sort of move this forward, what we have is a central dictate, a series of central dictates, which led to um, targets for factory owners being put in place. Now, uh, Mark Harrison from Warwick University, who's probably the leading economic historian of the Soviet Union, posed the question, um, if you take away the profit incentive, if you actually apply a broad Marxist perspective on um, central commitment to the state and therefore workers um, looking to contribute towards developing a development in a much wider canvas, how do you motivate them with the profit motive being moved to um, a lower run and in some cases eliminated? Now, it's not a, a difficult um, argument to put forward, but Mark Harrison has consistently uh, argued and put a, an economic framework to this, that in fact what replaces uh, monetary profit is coercion. And therefore what starts developing from 1928 is particularly a strong desire to make the, the workers, quotes, fear for their lives at time when it comes to their jobs. Mark Harrison considered how the Soviet Union motivated its workers and considered the alternatives that were available to it given that state control of manufacturing, set wages, set prices, largely removed the uh, profit motive or the money, or the desire for money that we actually see in the West. Now, uh, Mark Harrison is probably our leading economic historian, professor of economics at Warwick University, and he's argued reasonably persuasively that the key factor pushing industrialization forwards was coercion. You take away the profit motive, looking to gain money through economic activity, you replace it with fear. And Harrison's arguments are that the Soviet system of central planning worked, worked, inefficient, it worked inefficiently compared to the capitalist West, but worked nonetheless. He particularly argues that if the system was going to collapse, it wasn't in 1991, it would have been in 1941, the beginning of the Great Patriotic War, and Hitler's uh, movement into annexing the fertile and productive lands um, west of the Urals. Um, in the case of direct invasion, in terms of moving productive capacity, um, destroying comp productive capacity, if the central planning system was going to um, implode, it would have been then. Most rational people would argue that the loss of life during the 1930s was unjustifiable to meet the ends of Soviet industrialization. One of the more caustic comments about the entire process of change is that by the 1980s, the Soviet Union had an industrial base that looked like that of Germany in the 1880s, a little more modernized, but still fundamentally um, behind the way that the West had developed in the same time. Now, that is a, a very grim way of looking at it. Um, those people who were put under pressure to succeed, to achieve the goals of the five-year plans. What you've got to bear in mind is the five-year plans were subject to periodic review. Um, I think it's fair to say that you didn't actually have a five-year plan completed before the next five-year plan is put in place. And such was the nature of resource allocation in the Soviet Union. What you found was um, people were targeted, factory, owner, factory operators and managers were targeted on units of production as opposed to value of production. Now that's a, a minor point, but it, it, it does involve the use of human labour in a way that uh, you might not otherwise have, have thought of. 
um, considering that the goals needed to be pushed through quite strongly and, and forcefully during the time of each year's component of the plan. Now, um, were matters to rest in these terms, it would be bad enough. But uh, Stalin's growing paranoia about being challenged and um, his cultivation of a cult of personality, something of a cliche now, saw him systematically remove all those who could challenge him or would challenge him. 1937, 1938 saw the Great Terror, the movement of Stalin against those who were likely to challenge his rule and his uh, methods of controlling the Soviet Union. Now, uh, there's a way of thinking about this, that perhaps in a society it's the most creative, uh, those with the best brains, who will be critical, uh, who will be uh, looking to improve or challenge the existing status quo. If you are going to remove that category of individuals, then you have uh, an issue about how um, the society is going to develop. If you are removing the farmers from collectivization in terms of the leadership, if you are move, uh, removing um, those who are thinking in a different direction, as a challenge or as an alternative to the way that Stalinist rule is conducting, because they are thinking in a different way, then you are losing opportunity and the quality of leadership and management within the society is likely to drop as well. So uh, as well as the loss of human life, which is tragic, you also have the issue about the uh, dilution of the human capital within Soviet society, uh, whether it be leadership, scientific, farming, education, for those people who voiced an opinion away from what Stalin decreed was appropriate may find themselves in a gulag. If they're lucky, most of them found themselves dead. Now, I mentioned that the um, estimates run between 10 and 30 million. Most contemporaries would argue that um, we should be trending towards the lower end of those figures, but that's still a tragedy. If you want to think about the commitment of the Soviet Union under Stalin, um, let's consider the Eastern Front. Um, the BBC, when it came to the millennium reviews of the 20th century, um, when they asked what was the war of the century, said it's the Eastern Front, it's the war between Germany and the Soviet Union, 1931 to 1945. 